Well, earlier I got the thoughts of the Security Minister, Tom Tegenhat, on the Elphick statement on UK-Russia relations and also why the UK won't halt arms sales to Israel if it invades Rafah. Take a listen. Good to have you on the programme today. Thank you for coming on. It's the kind of morning after the defection from Natalie Elphick from the Conservatives to the Labour Party. She said the Conservatives were abandoning the centre ground. Do you agree with her that parties win from the centre? Well, I think parties win when they have principles. And, and what Keir Starmer is showing us is that, frankly, he's got a party that includes Zara Sultana on one side and Natalie Elphick on the other, but has no room for the guy he wanted to put into number 10 only a few years ago, Jeremy Corbyn, or Diane Abbott, who's been campaigning for the Labour movement for, what is it, 20, 30 years? I mean, it's a remarkable thing. This is a church so broad, it's offering bar mitzvahs. OK, right. That's not quite the question I asked. Do you think that parties win from the centre ground? Yes, I do, which is why I've always been a strong advocate of centrist policies, and you know that. Yeah. But it's not just from the centre ground. You've got to actually have values and things that people understand. And, you know, I like Keir. He's a, he's a decent guy. But I have no idea what he stands for. You know, he was, he was standing alongside somebody who voted to abandon the nuclear deterrent one minute. Now he's saying that he stands with us on defence policy. He was opposing us on the Rwanda scheme. Now he's just welcomed somebody whose single biggest priority is uh, the migrant question and has backed the Rwanda scheme. And in fact, only the day before she swapped sides was saying that Keir wasn't up to it. So, you know, it's a remarkable fault for us. But just to talk about the Conservatives, and you know, you're right, you, know, you are someone who's always espoused centre ground uh, principles, if you like. Um, you, of course, ran for leadership, didn't get it, so you have to follow someone else's vision. Do you worry that the Conservatives are drifting away from that centre ground? No, I think what we're doing is we're resetting uh, a party that lost its way a little bit. Uh, you know, we know that. And what Rishi has done brilliantly is he's brought us back to the centre and he's making sure that we have the kind of policies that make a difference. Look, his tax-cutting agenda, he's dealt with NI, as you know, giving people about £900 back uh, each year. That's, you know, that's a good start. He's reset on defence, going up to 2.5%. It's a great start. And, you know, he's reset the relationship with the European Union through the TCA. These are really important decisions. Because I, I was intrigued, I'll be honest, uh, during the kind of local election coverage mm. madness, uh, by a tweet that you retweeted that I think we can see it. It's, it's by the um, political editor, Byland Times. Uh, he said, uh, the amount of coverage given to the Green Party, who have so far won 159 seats in these elections, compared to Reform UK, who have won two, has been quite something. Yeah, it's I the think... Conservatives who are banging on about reform all the time. No, well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about policies of many different parties. But one of the things that I think we haven't covered properly is, you know, reform... Uh, sorry, the, the Green Party aren't just, you know, an environmental movement. They want to abandon uh, any defence force. They want to uh, totally but change I'm our tax just, system. I'm just intrigued, though, because, you know, you're saying that we, 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 we're focusing too much on reform. But, but that, you, you could argue, no, no, not, is I'm what the Conservatives are doing. No. Do you think there is, you know, it's a genuine question, do, do you think that there is a risk for the Conservatives in just focusing too much on reform and perhaps missing out on the voters that you're losing to the Lib Dems or the Green Party or the Labour Party? Sorry, what Adam was talking about was media focus. Yeah, I know. Okay, so, I know that's about what I'm talking about is the Conservative Party focus. So, in Tunbridge, I focus on every opponent who... Uh, you know, who's, it sets out a different agenda because my job, my, what I try to do, is to serve everybody in the community. And so I try to listen to everybody, I try to hear what people need and what changes they want in our community. And some of those voices are Lib Dem or Green or Labour or Reform or whatever they happen to but, be. But look, look, the question uh, is, the question is, do you think the Conservatives are at risk of focusing too much on reform and not enough on voters that are losing to other parties? So I think, look, I, I, forgive me, I, I hadn't quite nailed down what your question was. I, I get your point. And I think it's an interesting way of looking at it. I think the way that the Conservative Party has been looking at these questions in the last year or so, I think has been much more sensible. We're not trying to chase down the right or, you know, do those sort of things that people spoke about a year or two years ago. What we're trying to do is offer a vision for the whole country. You see, I guess, is... I guess my point is, right, you know, it, it's all very well saying that, saying that, yes, you, you believe in centre-ground politics mm. and that's why Rishi Sunak is from the centre-ground. You don't think it's a good idea to chase reform too much and that's why you're not doing it. But if you look at your policies, you're talking about Rwanda, you're talking about immigra illegal immigration all the time, you're, you're making the decision to cut taxes as opposed to invest in public services. Some would say you are... Sorry, Sophie, going... I, don't, I don't accept that. I mean, it, it, it's a fair challenge, but I don't accept that. 
I think the 2.5% in defence is an investment in public services in the UK, OK, a particular one. I think if you look at the amount that we put into the National Health Service, that is a fantastic investment in public services in the UK. If you look at the work we've done on things like the NHS app and the transformation of health services in the UK, that is an investment in public services in the UK. Okay. Look, of course it's true we're talking about Rwanda and we're talking about migration because these are things that matter to the British people. But you're absolutely right, other things do too. I talk a lot about education mm. in my constituency. You'll understand that, you know, as the security minister, I focus on things that I can't always talk to you about mm. um, a lot of the day. But in my work in, in Tunbridge, I focus a huge amount on education, on healthcare, on making sure we have the right delivery for people in a whole number of different ways. Okay. And that's centre ground Tory politics, it's accountability, it's delivery, and it's the kind of things that make a difference to everybody's lives. Uh, you've got an announcement today, uh, you talked about your ministerial job there, about what's the right. idea? Well, look, this is something that has come up, I'm afraid, too often uh, in recent years, and it's something that I'm getting a grip of, because what we need to do is not just have a visa system that obviously refuses those who are obviously spreading hate, but actually understands where they're coming from and where those pressures are. And that's why I'm looking to work with the Foreign Office, getting a team together from the Foreign Office, from DLUC, the Department for Leveling Up Communities and Housing, and of course from the Home Office, to make sure we're understanding who's coming in, who's trying to separate our community, who's trying to say that, you know, our community doesn't belong together, and trying to say that Britain should be divided, because that's not acceptable. It's absolutely not acceptable that we have people coming to the UK and spreading hate. So we're looking upstream, we're making sure that we know who's trying to come and why they're trying to come so that we can uh, interdict and, and make sure they don't get visas and they get kicked out if they, uh, if they need to be. It's something that I'm kind of you know, starting to think a bit more of with the weather getting better. We've got a summer of sport coming up, you know, Euros, yeah. Olympics. Are you worried about terror threat levels? Look, I, it's, you're never going to find me relaxed about it, Sophie. It's something that, uh, you know, dominates my waking hours and some of my sleeping hours too, but it is something that is incredibly important to get right. But I have huge confidence in our intelligence and security services. They are fantastic. And, you know, we, we've, we've heard an awful lot about world leading this and global that. Our intelligence services have a culture, an ethos, a and a dedication that makes them just genuinely exceptional. And I'm not often able to say thank you to them publicly, so thanks for the opportunity. I'm going to say it now, because there are people working now whose names you will never know, whose jobs you will never be exposed to, who are making really difficult decisions on who to prioritise and who not to, and where to put that focus mm. in order to keep us safe. And, and I have enormous confidence in them, and I'm sure they're going to do absolutely the best for the United Kingdom. Um, there's just a couple more uh, important issues I want to uh, squeeze in, if I may, uh, because yesterday we saw the Russian defence attaché expelled uh, right. from Britain. Um, are we expecting reciprocal action? Is there a danger of escalation? Look, that's a decision for the Russians, I'm afraid. I'm not going to speculate on that. We took a very important decision yesterday, and uh, it's one that, frankly, we've been extremely patient on, uh, and some may say too patient. What we have been wanting to do for a long time is make sure that all routes and avenues that Russia is using to try to undermine the UK is clo are closed off. This particular one, there was a balance, and you can understand why there's a balance with any of these decisions. And I'm glad that we've come down on this side of the fence now, because we, it's... Have we been too patient? No, I, look, I don't think so, but it's, it's, a, fair, it's a fair test. It's a fair tendency to turn the page. You've got to balance that need for access into the Russian military establishment so that you make sure you avoid misunderstandings, particularly when the Russians are actively invading a European state, as they are in Ukraine. But there comes a point where the cost-benefit analysis doesn't work anymore. And I think we've got other ways of influencing and making sure Russia understands. And so I think we've made the right decision. And you'll understand that, you know, we've always got to be checking and making sure that we're taking a balanced approach to this. But the prime responsibility of this government, of any government, that we made absolutely clear in the integrated review is that security will always come first. And that's why we took the decision. Um, talking about the Middle East now, uh, if I may, mm. uh, David Cameron said today the UK won't follow the US in halting arms sales to Israel if it invades Rafah. So, 
does this basically mean, you know, the US is now more hardline than we are when it comes to Israel? The US is in a very different position and, and the comparison doesn't really work. You so know, you've heard this line and I'll be honest, I don't get it. Okay, I don't understand. Well, let me, let me explain it, Sophie, because it's, mm. you know, the US uh, has two ways of delivering arms to Israel. First of all, it sells weapons in the normal way, right? So ship comes with selling shells or equipment or whatever. And that supplies an awful lot of Israel's armaments. And the second way is there is storage capabilities in Israel which are released at times of national emergency that are under US control and that Israel is then able to access. We don't have either of that. Our connection to Israel in arms terms is it's less than 1%. It's a very, very small technical element. And so it's a completely different question. But do we still help provide Israel with arms? Look, we, we don't do anywhere like No, no, what that's the US not does. the question. Uh, yeah, okay, if we're smaller, obviously it's smaller than the no, US. No, no, but it's, but it's but not even smaller. It's, it's infinitesimally smaller. I mean, it, what it, is that 1% then? Is look, that arms I'm not to Israel? Gonna, you, you'll forgive me. I'm not going to go into the well, details. No, but it's important because, okay, yeah, you can say, yes, of course, the US supplies much, much more arms more directly, but we still do have a link to arms used by Israel. Are we, are we happy, you know, if that, some of their armament is then used in the invasion we, of look, Rafa? Are you comfortable with that? We've been very, very clear that we would always be concerned if there was a a major military incursion into Rafa. We're really concerned and we've been very, very what if, clear. What if, what if UK supplied or, or armaments are used uh, in it? Forgive me, Sophie, I can't, for very specific reasons, I can't go into the details of what it is, but that is not likely to happen. The, the reality is we're dealing with a very, very different element here and our relationship is very, very different from the United States. I wish I could go into detail, but I'm afraid I can't. The reality is we do not do the bulk weapons sales that the US does, and therefore they are in a very different position. Now, we're also in a different position in our relationships with Middle Eastern countries, and you've heard, David, be incredibly clear. We have been front and centre of getting aid into those Palestinian areas and making sure that those people who are currently so vulnerable get the support that we can possibly offer. And we've also been incredibly clear with the Israeli authorities that they have a responsibility here. And, you know, you don't need me to tell you this, David's been saying it incredibly publicly, but many Israeli politicians have been saying it too, that actually the Israeli government has a responsibility to look after the humanitarian concerns of those on the ground. And we have been incredibly clear that Israel has a humanitarian responsibility in those areas. And, you know, that is something that we are able to do because of the relationship we have, not just with Israel, but also with Jordan, with Egypt, with Saudi Arabia and with others. OK, thank you very much indeed. Tom Tegan. Thank you.